right there. Um, and unfortunately, I went to go work for a startup and figured I'd go native um, after I retired, so I grew the hair and the beard, and some of you may or may not recognize me from the past. I've been here with uh, Security Onion since 2012 and, and B-Side since the, pretty much the beginning. Our team in South Carolina that I helped start um, started volunteering amid, uh, when the schoolhouse first started up teaching uh, across the way. But uh, we've, I've done a few things. I like doing home improvement. I went to work for a big vendor, and then I left that big vendor. Uh, one of my friends here is still at that big vendor. I'm sorry, buddy, but uh, the startup world is awesome. I loved it, and I can't, I can't exclaim anything more about it, as Chris and a few others will tell you. It's a lot of work, though. Um, it's like flying the plane and building it at the same time, so it's a lot of fun. So what is the problem we're trying to solve, said no an analyst ever, right? And the only thing I can tell you is I drink and I do know some things. <laughs> only I, wine is not one of them that I drink often enough. I probably should drink more of it because uh, I get into the whiskey and scotches and then it tends to get a little bit more expensive. But the idea is, is that I had to put the obligatory GOTS reference in here somewhere. But the way we got here and the problem we're trying to solve is this guy. Back in 2012, I met Raphael Munch for the first time, and I met Cobalt Strike for the first time. And then I had myself and my ego reset several times over a period of days, um, thankfully from him and his team of the Red Teamers, pretending to be somebody that they, yeah, pretending to be somebody that they wanted to do, um, little Red Team Wrangler over here, and giving me all kinds of hell with Beacon. Um, and I, uh, developing a team and training, we didn't give, we've seen a lot of people go into the problem with a bunch of tools, whether they're, they were from Mandiant, they were pushing in Splunk, they were bringing in all kinds of tools. The one tool that has remained consistent across the board is Security Onion. Because it's more than just a network management tool, as you've all probably seen over a period of time. And so when I looked at this particular problem, and we, we had a, a guy early in, the, uh, in 2012 basically go in, and I think it's somebody mentioned to me earlier, it might be something very similar to Snort Sam, but he actually live during when we were, were going through this exercise, he went through and created a couple of scripts that basically took um, Snort and started making it and, and the processes that come out of Security Engine to actively start upstream blocking and making it into a pseudo IPS. And I always wanted that capability, but I'm not that coding smart for this, uh, this gentleman, uh, um, Jose Ortiz. I wasn't as smart as he was to try and be able to accomplish that goal. So I've been waiting, I've been working with Security Onion, working with teams, trying to develop my team's capability, and in 2015, I kicked Raphael's butt okay, with my team. And how did we do it? We got really smart on Windows. Um, and because once the guys identified the traffic and how the traffic was occurring, then they could go in and use no tools. App Locker, love App Locker, anybody? Could use some of the tools to start blocking the way they were maneuvering and contain them in their space. That was when we started learning how to use Security Onion the way it was intended. The key that I wanted to talk about here is what we look at as the problem inside the ULU. Um, when I was at this conference, there was this thing, uh, I had this rivalry with my Air Force peers. And one of my rivalries was the fact that I had to somehow get the Navy Top Gun reference in my talk. Um, of how I got totally inverted in cyber. So the idea, the idea is, is that the, we really need to understand, orient, decide, and act. And John Boyd came up with this idea about how to get ahead of the attackers that he was dealing with in the air. And if there's a lot of parallels with military war fighting and how cyberspace is developing as not only as a battlefield, but as we fight on it every day from every breach or every event or every piece that we're doing. And this is one of those things just like the um, others that have come in out of there like threat intelligence, right? That have come out of there that actually make an effect on people. The thing is, is that we've only automated these portions here. What we haven't started to automate, except for a few companies, is the decide and act piece. But you'll hear things like AI, artificial intelligence, you'll hear things like machine learning, 
And there are companies that have been using machine learning for the better part of 15 years, trying to solve your problem. That was my big vendor speech. They've been using AI and machine learning for a lot longer, and they're very experienced in it. If we could solve the problem with machine learning, we would have done it already. Crime is not something that we can solve with machine learning, maybe with our artificial intelligence, until you get somebody like uh, Ryan over here who will <coughs> poison your AI just to cause you to cause problems, to create it even more. Because the actors will think outside of the box. So you have to be able to observe your adversary, orient yourself in a position that you can fight that adversary, and then make a decision. Flip him the bird or run away. It's your choice, <laughs> right? But the idea is, is making those decisions and those actions. Now, um, when I first started thinking about how I was gonna do this talk and what I was gonna focus in on, um, I didn't want it to become a sales pitch, but we all know we're in sales, right? So you're gonna hear a little bit about the product I worked for and, and how that plays in. But the other part of it was, for me, is to get you guys to understand there's a problem. We are the problem. The human is the problem in the loop. The machine can make a decision, but we try to tell the, the machine to make a decision based on how we interpret the data. And we have to change our thought processes. You've gotten use case development from Don, you're gonna see pivoting from Chris, and I'm trying to put it all together in one shot. My biggest number one use case is phishing. Number one, every customer across the board wants to move ahead of the target pattern and try to get up into that preventive and solve the phishing problem. Or as uh, Mark would call it, turn every user in your environment into a phishing hunting capability by spamming the heck out of them internally along with your own fish so that they just get conditioned to every time they see something that doesn't look right, they just send it and populate it. But the idea is every fish that comes in what does it look like? How do you analyze that use case? How do you move forward? So let's just take an a, a little look at the integration that I did to Seagull to give you an idea, or Seagull, to give you guys an idea of what I've tried to accomplish. So please, this is the demo gods portion of my, it may or may go terribly, we'll see. I wanna thank um, a friend of mine, Tim Frazier. Where is my, there it is. Where? See, there we go. Do you see it? No, you guys don't see it. That's why. Is that better? So if we log into my, yep. All of you have seen this before. It's not, it's kind of small because of the screen resolution, but you've seen this before. You, most of you have been worked or have been trained to work at a uh, SQL as many times as you can. And I'm messing up the name frequently, so please just kill me later. Um, the rules and everything that's going on, but if you can see these alerts right here. Possible PE download policy, what I learned a long time ago is that you don't turn the rules off on your NSM, <laughs> right? Turning rules off, even if they say ET policy, is not a really good plan. So what I figured out is, is that when I started using this tool, there's only two ways to communicate from this to any part of my other teams. Because the IDS analyst is, and I've seen this in IRs, is heading keyboard like this. And he's like, hey, uh, IP address 10.9.5.6, yeah, it's getting hit. <laughs> and what information, what port, what HTTP, what's the URL? Give me more info so that eventually you learn, the team learns how to work together to, to spit that information across back and forth. The problem is, is that it's not fast enough. Because I've literally had guys sitting on the keyboard trying to kill a task, kill a script, while the attacker is trying to reboot the box. Right? And eventually my guy loses because his fingers are not fast enough and Cobalt Strike is a little bit faster than he is just by basic running scripts. So the idea is, is that we have these capabilities and we want to be able to create a report or do something that, but we, don't, we have a very limited option 
And those of you that like JSON, you will like this implementation because I just added a REST export to Siegel. And as you can see up there, the REST export there, if you click it, saves the file just in case you lose it. I want to write over the existing, and it's gone. If for some reason, you know, the alerts are alerts, right? They don't have a whole lot of information in them, but they do have the payload, and you can read the payload and, and go and review the payload. But let's say you wanted to see the transcript. See? Demo fail. Here we go. Wake up. Yeah, my Mac is over here screaming. There we go. So we can see that the transaction here, uh, somebody would tell me that that's really not a good, if you can see that piece. Get the error. You can see the error here is uh, FWZSGCH is the, dom is the host, and then get CAS 11 PG. But the actual alert that this came from is a uh, image file representing or uh, representing itself as an exe. So if we take file send to phantom, that file leaves and goes away. Say we wanted to get this particular alert here. Malware executable sent to host claims to be an image. That's the same one. Let me go up a little bit further and see we have a couple of others up here. Grab that transcript. Let me see if I can go my older ones. We got Trojan abuse here. And say we want to look at the bro. We'll close that out. Oh, I lost it. Naturally, I'm having the, the demo gods are loving me right now. I must sacrifice a lieutenant. I haven't done that yet in a while. So, apologize. Um, now, if I could just type my password right, I'd be good. <laughs> if, I, if I made it so simple that it was that easy to remember, I'd probably be better off, but I didn't. So if we go back, come on now. <coughs> Trying to find one of those wonderful good ones that I had. May take a few seconds because I'm trying to run two VMs in the back end and it's still processing stuff while we're talking. So right now what happened on the back end is that REST uh, JSON file dropped on my Phantom instance is another VM on the backside. And how long do you think it would take you to do 220 some trans, uh, transpositions of a URL and a destination IP and a host, I, and a host domain against all your favorite um, favorite threat intelligence platform like VirusTotal or whatnot, or detonate the URL in some location, or actually do a, a contextual threat intelligence lookup. 
An hour, two hours, four hours, five hours? Two minutes per target. Two minutes per target? <laughs> Assuming you're 100% correct every time and you type in the address the right way every time, which you will not do. Let me get this one too. So I, naturally, I, I went through um, malwaretraffic.net. I pulled down a PCAP, the things that you didn't see me do, pulled down a PCAP, grabbed those PCAPs, and then turned around and reran them through my own in house security onion. So I kind of knew what I was looking for. But the idea is, is that the analyst knows what they're looking for. They'll go and find the threat, they'll use the transcript, they'll see the error that they want, and they want to send it to their buddy in the IR team to go do something with it, right? That's the whole, the whole focus here. That being said, once we get to the demo part, let me see if I, am I missing the, there we go. So the idea of, of SUDA was to get into being able to provide an adaptive cyber defense capability, which is to integrate not only just the IDS and the NSM, but also with the other components of your device. Unfortunately for me, I didn't have enough time in the time it took me to understand Tickle. If you guys think C, C++ is hard, try learning Tickle. Bam helped me with that piece, and it was a big pain in the butt, but I was able to extend by cutting and pasting and doing a lot of plagiarism of what they were already do to be able to rat, add the REST Python capabilities to be able to export the rules so that I could actually process the rules automated. But the idea is we want to demonstrate a capability to get to time to detect and time to respond a lot faster for the analyst. Because the problem with our use cases is that we need to make the analyst decide and act. But they need information. And it depends on where you are in the incident response cycle, how you get that information to the customers. So why this made this so important to me in the long run is because I had some really good friends, most of you might see him later, and Paul, if you're here, you're gonna hurt me. But somebody came out and said on Twitter, and they gave it, and they always get good, we get good pro tips coming out of here. Don't spend a lot of time on doing things, and don't listen to all the hype. And I'll tell you, don't listen to all the hype. If you're ready to do automation, you don't have to have a fully formed thought process or use case to do it. Because use cases and playbooks don't work in the same realm. You want to be able to build them the best that you can. But you want to be able to orchestrate these capabilities beyond the IP shun capability. Right? The tool has to do more than just block a rule in a firewall, which was what we were doing before. <laughs> When we first did that first uh, Snort Sam like implementation, it was just an IP shun to a firewall trying to break the command and control. And as you all know from the kill chain, it works. It's just not going to be fast enough, and they're just going to change and pivot and keep going. Because for them, changing an IP address, changing a domain, changing a hash, relatively insignificant to them, and it creates a whole other nightmare for you to track it down. But the idea is, is that what you want is you want to be able to measure your dwell time and your time to contain, right? And then automate what your best practices are. That's the idea. So how many of you have written a use case document like Don has? You don't have to raise your hand because I know most of you haven't. Reason being is because I've spent the better part of my consulting time in the last five years writing them for companies. Um, it's painful, it's arduous, it's necessary. It all depends on your governance and your, and your systems requirements, but if you have to write one, then you realize how much you don't want to write them, and if you've written a whole security operations manual from cover to cover, page to page, roll by roll, you don't ever want to do it again. You want to template that, make it pretty, put it on a PowerPoint or SharePoint site, um, and then leave it there and nobody ever touches it for five or six years uh, and the rules have changed and people have moved and then eventually you'll go down and update it again. <coughs> but automating is something that you're going to need to do in order to do what? Hunt. 
If you can't get the mundane security processes out of your out of your deal, you can't hunt for the bad guys pivoting on your environment. You can't use those cool tools like Brophy to turn around and go do those pieces because you're too busy shunning accounts. Somebody's getting threat intelligence from US CERT, and you gotta go run hash queries across your entire environment by hand by using a tool like Ismail wrote for Rostrador and using Yara scripts or whatever process you use. The idea is, is that we want to minimize the things that keep you, that you do all the time. And I can't tell you how many times I've went, done a SOC assessment, came into a team, the level three just tells the level one, I got this, and they go do it. Because the tool or script they use is too good for them, works great for them, but doesn't work great for the level one analyst, doesn't get them the information that they need. Meanwhile, the level three is doing a ransomware environment. How hard is that to remediate? It's not, right? Get the system off the network. Find out what caused it. All those things are already recorded into your systems. So let's take a, a, a typical use case scenario that I end up falling into, right? I get, a, I get a use case understanding for customers with regards, I try to relate it to focusing on the goals you're trying to achieve. Right? It's a sequence in a series of events that you're trying to accomplish. Right? And it's those in interfaces and inputs and interactions, just like Don talked about, between the, the individual actors in that scenario. And just like this ordering, uh, ordering your meal, you have different capabilities. Who's going to do what? Who's going to interface? What data input outputs are being required? <laughs> How many people do this to their security operations environment? And I recently went through a class with uh, Chris um, Crowley on the SANS Management 517 course that teaches you security operations. And you'll see, some of, uh, you'll see something come out of there that's his course, which is the inputs, interactions, and, uh, inputs, interactions, and artifacts and, and uh, actions of an environment. And those are some of the things that you want to record when you start going in place. Because if you look at this particular use case, semantic endpoint protection, alert causes, um, us to run a malware bytes inspection, how many people have done that? Run another tool against an existing tool just because if you, malware bytes comes back clean, then Semantic did its job, yay, well, I'm moving on, right? I'm not even, no more investigation, I'm moving on, I'm just gonna reboot the box, call it a day, right? Then, but the business objective and the business justification is what the leadership wants from that use case. What you've gotta figure out is how to do it. When you start going through that process, Right? That's where we start to turn into a playbook. Because it's all those pieces that you're doing in that process. Who are you interacting? What is the specific task that you're trying to accomplish? And that's where use cases and playbooks are different. Um, a couple of peers of mine started a, 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 a GitHub page about playbooks and trying to get cut people to support a playbook methodology where you build questions you add the questions that you should be asking about the playbook so that you can do consistent, um, consistent investigations based on information requirements. And that's really what you need to do. But in the grand scheme of things, in these pieces, you're going to break up them into little modules. You're going to ingest some kind of alert. You're going to be able to prioritize and categorize that alert. You're going to go and gather more information. You're going to contextualize. You're going to want to do some kind of containment capability. Maybe even eradication if that's in your, in your wheelhouse, right? But you're going to want to be able to hunt for the other systems in your environment that may have the same problem. So what we tried to come up with is that when you start to look at the incident response plan problem and how to build your use cases, people start to boil the ocean with a spoon. So much things that I can think about, so many use cases, and thanks, Don, for writing a book that's going to get us started on this piece, because a lot of times we use that same book. It was the first, if they didn't have it, it was the first book. I had extra ones in my bag. It was Don's first book that I basically was giving to SOC analysts, where do we start? Here's where you start, right? Same thing with Red Team Field, the Red Team Field Manual, right? If you didn't know where to start, here's a good place to start. 
But the idea is, is that you take these security policies, you implement them into an incident response policy. Those incident response poli policies should give you some kind of categorization, right? And in that categorization, you should develop response plans that are according to those. How are you going to respond to those types of events? And you will do that with any governance event or anything that you measure, right? Just as uh, Don talked earlier, right? And you tie that to your attack vectors. Because once you do that, then you get something that looks like this. This is pre-2015 categorizations for DOD. It's pretty simplistic. It's pretty easy to put together. It's it's easy to implement because it's across the board. You can see from investigating, moving up in precedence, you know what the problem is. If you get a root cause or root level intrusion, you know you need to get a hold of that box quickly. Right? And there's ways to discern that. Now, if you have admins all over your environment, like it's very popular in startup, everybody's an admin, then everything that is malware related is a root level intrusion. Right? So that could be a bad day for some folks. Your attack vectors, your attack vectors haven't changed. There are three primary ways that malware gets on a box and one actor. Three primary ways and one actor. If you take that and you apply those to your incident response plans, now what you get is nine to 10 different use case blocks and whether you're gonna track an event or an incident and when does an event become an incident, right? And you can move it up the stack, and then you can build your response plans based on your IRPs, or your incident responses. Now, what are you gonna do? You could do different things, right? Then there was this other document that you guys all have seen before. Maybe, how many have actually seen this before in the room? I've actually scrolled down to page seven of the kill chain document and actually saw that course of action table. Because the course of action table is more important than the kill chain itself because these are the tools that you don't have if you can't detect. If you are buying tools that can't detect things in the first row, you're doing it wrong. Right? Visibility. We learn that visibility is the first thing that we have to understand. And then we start to figure out, well, what other things as we mature and go over? And then some people will observe that there is a column missing uh, off this for DOD that used this in the way it was developed. Anybody can tell me which column's missing? Destroy. Destroy, right? Hook the IDS up to the drones. Hook it up to the drones, that's awesome. <laughs> now that we got arms, that's, that should be easy. <laughs> but the idea is, is that I've also switched it up and I, I mixed the attack model against the MITRE because I like the way MITRE does their attack model better because they get more in depth on what we need to be looking for. I mean, if you haven't looked at the MITRE attack model um, since they GPL'd it, then you need to go out and take a look at it because your hunting starts there, right? Everything that you need to know about new actor, existing actors and capabilities starts right there and you can start going after that. So we talked about uh, initially about inputs, interactions, actions, and artifacts. And what we want to really kind of core in is the playbook development capabilities for anything that you do in the system is how you're interacting with the system. How I interact with the NSM or Security Onion defines the inputs, the interactions, and the actions and the artifacts. But I always have to keep the end in mind. What is the need versus the want that Don talked to you about earlier, right? Because you need to understand where you're gonna have to pivot, which Chris is gonna tell you later, right? And all of, us, all of us spend time doing threat intelligence. If you're not on Twitter collecting threat intelligence, if you're not using a tool like Threat Connect, Anomaly, OTX, or you're, or you're trolling executables of malware and reversing them, or you're following Brad on malware or malwaretraffic.net, it doesn't really matter where you are or what you're doing. The idea is that you have to understand the artifacts of the deliverables. That is the decision action point for the analyst. Now, how many of you have done your phishing analysis, right? Looked at a phishing email, looked at the body of the email, looked at the headers and said, okay, that's malicious. Anybody on their, on their IR pieces? Most good, good majority, right? The idea is, is that if you've done that, how do you think your use case is for your 
for, when you build the process for somebody to analyze it, you're gonna take the email out of the client, you're gonna push it to somewhere where you can go view it, you're gonna go view it, this is the manual process, right? You're gonna go view it, you're gonna write down all your steps because you're gonna teach that intern how to do the exact same thing you're doing. And they'll go there, review it, and they'll go, okay, well I see that the, the reply to and the actual sender don't match in the header fields, okay, something's wrong here, right? Those are the kinds of things that you're looking for in header analysis, and then you got file analysis. Well, it takes a little bit to do a file, I have to figure out, well, it looks kind of suspicious, there's no links in it. All the things that you take into play start to build those artifacts and capabilities. And what are, the, what are the actions that you're doing, the transformation, the duties, the responsibilities? That all ties into who's responsible for what? Who's actually doing the work? Who's accountable to make sure that that thing works? Who needs to give you the approval to block if you needed to block or remove, right? And who needs to be informed when you do that? All those people have to be in play in that process. And then what's the actual input source that actually creates the event? Whether it's a similar and then a similar, whether it's a phishing email dropped in your inbox, it doesn't matter where the alert comes from, the playbook will process it the same. So when we take that and we apply the process, you can see that the use case for the kitchen cleans itself up fairly easy. And I know where the input is, I know where who the interfaces are, I know who the actions are, and I've simplified it on verbs, right? The verbs are the, are the point where you want to focus in on because those are the things that you're going to have to add detail to, right? And then I know what the end artifact or what the end state is. So if we take that typical security automation, we take it from initi initial event to end state, we have a problem. And the problem comes into play is that everybody builds monolithic playbooks from beginning to end. A phishing event starts to the end ticket closure point. Is that very efficient when you build 300 of them? Anybody manage an MSSP, Don? When you build use cases and you build them electronically, right? You build, an, and you build the use case and the playbook from beginning to end, every actor, every piece, the workflow, everything's there. But the problem is, is if you change from, say, service now to remedy, you're gonna have a bad day. Or maybe you're going the other way, right, for some people. You're gonna have a bad day because now you have 300 use case automated playbook scripts that you have to turn around and update. And we have the same problem in our environment. So we came up with this idea of modular playbooks. And in the modular playbooks, you come up with it ingestion, investigation, containment, and then you move on to um, notification and documentation. The idea behind ingestion is to set up the, the artifact that's coming in, the input that's coming in, and get it ready for investigation. What are the components that the analyst needs in order to do that investigation, right? Conduct the investigation. Provide the analyst as much information and decision points as they can to conduct the investigation that they need to do based on the workflow that's been defined, right? Containment. Try to automatically contain if possible. If you can't, that's okay. At least give the analyst a choice or, ch or point to choose to do that containment, right? Notification, let people know that something happened. Documentation, update your system of record. The tool that we have can do incident and event case management. That's not what the primary focus of it, but it can do that. You still need a system of record to measure other things long term. Notice that eradication is not in this cycle. I'm not a fan of going from containment to eradication immediately. You have to understand what you just tried to contain in more context. Uh, Ismail can attest that uh, I went in 2016 to a customer site um, and within 24 hours they had one version of the virus and that virus was in their environment for about 12 hours um, before they started cleaning it up. Then they had six versions. By the end of the 24 hours after I was there, they went from roughly about 200 systems compromised to over 2,100 of a 4,500 system environment. And you can't take the model of some folks and go, okay, well, I'm gonna just walk in there and I'm gonna rebuild all your boxes, because that's not gonna fly. 
2100 system rebuild is not going to work, right? Unless you, unless you did a Sony or a, a Shamoon virus and wiped them completely, saved me the effort of making that decision. Right? <laughs> Which I would love because it just makes it easier from an IR standpoint. You have to go clean it up instead of me having to pitch back to a, revert, to a reverse engineer and say, I need to know what this thing does. Meanwhile, the customer is sitting there going, aren't you fixing it? We have a preliminary containment mechanism in. I don't know if it's controlling all the modules. We have to go figure it out. And we have to pull the piece out. This particular uh, virus that I was dealing with was called pink slip. It was kind of apropos for the, for the CISO. <laughs> but he did not like it when I said that either. He was not, not he was not a happy camper about it. But we take the use case, right, for this one, snort alert, detect, suspicious download, contextualize it, investigate the alert, create and take it uh, with the information, notify the SOC IR analyst that the event has occurred, right? Categorization, malware, tag it from network, cat seven, it's a web transaction, severity and sensitivity, TLP amber, right? I can go all the way to this point, now I've contextualized I've ingested it and I've contextualized it. I've added not only between medium and cat seven, if I get a cat one coming in, the analyst knows which one to prioritize over the other medium, right? Because it may be, because what is the severity based on? Our severity and most severity is based on your SLA breach. When are you gonna breach an SLA? Versus when are you gonna, what's the real true priority of it? So we take that and we put it all together, and that snort alert for malware gets to the, has interactions with the SOC analyst, Phantom, Security Onion analyst, Carbon Black Response, ServiceNow email. The end state is to determine an incident, contain the incident, and record the incident, right? And these are just some of the actions that you could do in the process. The idea is, is that once you've thought this process through, through this point, now you can begin to create some kind of playbook that actually works through this process. If you create the playbooks modularly, right, how many people do file analysis in different ways? Or do you do it the same way every single time? Pretty much you're a creature of habit, right? That's how I am at least. File, file domain and URL analysis pretty much happen the exact same way and they're my favorite tools, right? But the, the nature of security operations is, is that I need, the leadership needs consistency of action across analyst to analyst to analyst. Because otherwise, I have a really great level three that does awesome work, but I have a level two that can't get the job done. How do you do the same thing that he's doing? Well, I get him to teach you how he does what he does, right? I formulate a process that keeps you all doing the same thing, and then when it's out of bounds, I give the analyst an option to escalate. That's usually how the security operations process has worked. Right? Agree, disagree? Put it right on. So now for the real demo. Hopefully, I won't mess this one up. Can you all see that? So as you can see, um, mean dwell time is about an hour and 11 minutes. Um, I've done some work already today. And you can see that I've probably saved about five hours and 28 minutes and somewhere in the around $250. I know, impressive, right? Not really. The impressive part is, is that I did two, while you guys were talking with me, I analyze one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different transactions, categorize them, and as the context will go, I checked with over 55 different types of threat intelligence appliances and performed four actions per those appliances while we were talking in 45 minutes on 10. How many analysts can do that speed? And so I've already identified zero IOCs from this one, even though the Chigura EDU might not be my favorite one because it showed up somewhere, right? So if I scroll down, 
Some things didn't even show up data. Some things failed. Let's see if I can find one that's a little bit better. See, all of them failed. Thanks. It might be my request that failed. On my live network, it works fine. The idea, so I'm going to go and do demo fail right now and call it a day. The idea is, is that I could probably troubleshoot the reason why I failed. I did this action just last night. And the idea is, is that you can check 55 different actions and, and correlate and do the pivot and get the information there. Right? If I pulled up one that I've previously done, which I think I have down below, maybe I won't call myself a liar. And it looks like pretty much all my actions failed on the internet, as you can see right there. So for some reason, I think I got kicked off the, the wireless here, or it blocked me off doing the wireless, and I could put it on my phone and redo it. But the idea is, is that you can coordinate and get all the threat intel capabilities that you would have normally on an incident. all into one location, and then turn around and add pins on top of it and categorize it and go through the process. That way, when you see a threat intelligence capability that actually calls something, you can just scroll down through the analyst. You can pop a pin up on top to be able to do that piece. The idea is, is that we want to be able to give the SOC analyst the capability to see what the snort analyst sees out of the gate. And what I was analyzing that I didn't show you was I was taking the IP transcript, converted it, turned it into Ceph JSON files, and then basically processed the, against those domains. And naturally, I don't know if you know that FWSG domain right down there. Would be bad right out of the gate. And it's already been seen. It get picked up by Palo Alto Autofocus. It also get picked up by Recorded Future, which was one of the other ones that I had on. So while I did have an epic demo fail, I hope that you can see the value in the process that I processed through 10. I had to make the connections and fail, but I could process through 10. Um, if you give me a little bit, a little bit more time later today, um, I'll get it on my phone and I'll push the connection through my phone and I'm sure I can prove it without question. <laughs> I do it all the time with customers. So. But the idea is, is that what we have to do is change our thought process and our mindset on how we do incident response when we start to do orchestration and automation into the OODA loop. Because the idea is, is that the decisions that you make as a human are not the same decisions that you would make, are not the same decisions that you would make as an analyst on a machine. So my concern at this point is to tr explain this one point in a phishing campaign, for example, as most customers have dealt with this problem. When you analyze a phishing, and we talked about in the beginning, most analysts will look, want to look at the email to process it. Does a machine want to look at the email and can it contextualize misspoken grammar, whether it's a fish or not? Most computer programs can't do that, right? So what do you want to focus in on? You want to focus on giving the analyst a decide and act capability. Right? How do I decide? How do I act? Right? For example, if I gave you a, if I sent you an alert, right, from an email that had already had a malicious attachment, whether I checked it with hash or I blew it up on a sandbox, doesn't matter which way, would you convict it right there? Would you even look at the headers? Would you even look at any of the domains related to the object? 
any of the URLs that are contained. Maybe? As a SOC analyst, would you? Probably. Probably? Not, not very far now. Not very far, right? Because you would convict it. I, here's what I teach and what I would do. I'd convict it. I'd go remove that mail and all the subsequent like mails out of their inbox, right? Across the board of the enterprise. Flip that back to my threat intelligence team if I had one. Or that's tomorrow's work when I get to it, right? If we're a one-man band kicking team. Right? Throw it back, and if I get to it, I may do some threat intelligence analysis on it. The object is, is the smaller the team, the more accurate the work has to be to conviction. The more time you have, then the more process you can add to it. Kick it back to your threat intelligence team, they rip it apart in a tool like this, they pull all the domains, they throw it all in MISSP, and then they run their processes against it, and they go, oh, by the way, I found three or four other domains that are also associated to that domain that could be if other phishing campaigns, can you go use your wonderful Splunk instance and go look for all that stuff? I notice I didn't say ArcSight because it's not fun to do it in ArcSight. <laughs> <laughs> but, or you know, maybe Elk, maybe Elk's a better tool to use in that, in that scenario. The idea is, is that going from the process that matters to the machine that versus the process that the human does is the biggest pain I've seen and security automation and orchestration. And how you're gonna get security onion to go into the OODA loop on the decide and act piece is by changing your mindset, not for you, but for the machine. Because I can process a hash and, and pop it into a sandbox and do domain analysis before I ever even think about doing header analysis or context analysis of the actual email embedded into the box. And 80% of the time to 90% of the time, I can convict off of those out of the gate. That if the analyst actually has to look at the email, it's mostly because it's what? <coughs> spam. And spam has a, a specific signature that most people would maybe agree 90 to 95% of the time. Spam comes with URLs and a file files, phishing doesn't normally come with both. One or the other, but not both. Usually. There are oddballs in that scenario. How are we doing on time? We are right on time because it's 2 o'clock. Awesome. So are there any questions? You can reach me at Psychologize up there on Twitter. Um, this Siegel uh, implementation that I did, the REST API plugin, um, also the Python scripts that actually you can convert for your own REST input for any other appliance capability are there. And then uh, the Phantom platform is free. If you ever want to get it, download it, you can go to Try Phantom and get access to the platform itself and play with it. You get 100, some of the small, small print here. Free version is limited to 100 actions. Um, the 55, 220 some actions it's actually about 15 actions across the board on our system. I just want you to know, I mean, you're a little self-deprecating when you're talking about how you pronounce squeal or seagull, as you called it. I have a tweet here from Bam Bisher, and he wants to know, is it too late to make that the official pronunciation? <laughs> <laughs> squeal or seagull? Yeah, it may be seagull now, officially. So you may have dramatically changed the scope. Well, I... I I think SGUI, I don't know why, but I, that's the way it came across in my head. I'm a change agent, I don't know about that. I, in, in, all, in all honesty, um, I'm a little bit intimidated because I have quite a few friends here that I consider mentors and, and leaders in the space, and I look up to them, and, and I want to do you guys justice. I apologize for not giving you the, the dirty on the, on the demo, but if you come and see me later, I'll, I'll plug it up and I'll run it again, just so you can see it. No, they don't have my hair. Unfortunately, some have tried, but some have failed. <laughs> uh, to be honest, they wanted me to stay in the military, and when I looked at my leadership, all my leadership was bold, and I was like, I'm not going to look like that, so I left. <laughs> well, I retired, so leaving and retiring is the same. That's a little bit of hate.